Okay, this is our third lecture, and today we're going to move on and discuss um, probably two most popular ways uh, to describe uh, data sets using pictures, using graphics. But before we do that, I wanted to point out a couple of things. Um, number one, we just finished a couple of lectures, uh, and in these two lectures we talked about basics of R. R is the package, statistical package, and the programming language for the package uh, at the same time. And we discussed um, what are the variables. Basically, everything that you do with the data, uh, the data itself, and the results of your manipulations with the data, they have to be recorded in the memory. That's why we need variables. So we discussed scalar variables that can hold one single value discussed vector variables when the variable name points to a number it's a list of values really an array and we discussed also the data frame that's kind of a two-dimensional uh, type of variable that has columns and rows so it's very similar to the uh, to the spreadsheet really the organization uh, of the data frame and that's what we're going to be using for the most part for the data analysis so all the data that we're going to read from the uh, data files, we're going to um, we're going to have a bunch of uh, data frames from that, and also we discussed, of course, how you can uh, read the uh, data file into the memory. For that, we use the function read.csv. So the majority of data sets that we're going to be dealing with, not the majority, all of the data sets that we're going to deal with. Uh, our uh, CSV comma separated value files and also we looked at the ways how you can summarize um, data and present that in the tabular form using table function and using uh, prop.table which takes the tabular values, tabulated values and calculates proportions from them. So uh, what I did is this, let me show you. Um, this is our scholar. So all the uh, code that we're going to do in class, first of all, of course, you you are pretty much expected to follow along um, with the with the videos and repeat the same exercises as I do in class in these lectures. Uh, so you're supposed to kind of go along with the uh, with the coding. But uh, at the end of uh, each of the chapters, I'm going to post the code online in one place so here's how to find the code uh, you just go to the course website and in the data sets I don't know I decided to post that stuff in the data sets I could move it uh, probably I'm going to move that actually to the lecture notes yeah after each chapter I'm going to post the R file so here right we used a Titanic CSV file in the um, uh, just to illustrate the table table function and uh, the code that uh, you saw in the in the video lectures I saved from the R studio as dot R file so dot R files are basically scripts it's kind of a program uh, everything that I did I saved in the file and here's what you need to do if you want to download that file and open in your R studio you have to click on that again reminder I warned you about that in the previous lecture do not use Internet Explorer it doesn't work nicely, especially with CSV files and uh, R scripts. That's what I found experimentally. Okay, so I'm using um, Google Chrome. So you have to click on the file, obviously. It will download the file. And after that, this is our script. So it's supposed to be linked with um, R Studio. So R Studio should be a default program to open .R files. And uh, that's what happens. So if I double click on that file, it opens up, opened up on my second screen, I have two screens, and that's what it looks like, okay? So essentially, this is everything that we did in uh, previous two lectures, okay? Now, in your case, first time when you open that file, double click um, the .r file, that may not happen. That's the, uh, the reason for that is because R Studio and R in general is the new program for your computer. We pretty much just installed it. Uh, your computer does not know yet that R files, dot R files, must be opened with uh, R Studio. So you may not see the R Studio, but you may see a window. I didn't get this window, but you may get kind of a window that says, I don't know what program to use in order to open this file 
apparently not no default program and uh, one of the options will read do you want to pick the program the default program from existing installed programs on your machine you should go along with this option and uh, pick our studio from the list of the possible applications programs to open dot r files and from now on so at that point your computer will associate dot r files with our studio and from now on every r script that you will download from scholar uh, you just have to double click it and it will automatically open up in our studio okay so that's basically how to open up all the files so i'm going to just close that one okay so let me switch back to um to the lecture so today we're going to discuss graphical descriptive techniques uh, so uh, descriptive means well it comes from the word describe obviously okay so um, it's fairly straightforward um, branch of statistics descriptive statistics and uh, so let's discuss let's discuss a little bit uh, kind of talk about concepts right in statistics first of all let's talk briefly about difference between populations and samples uh, population is everything that you may want to know about certain subject matter. So, in case of biological species, such as, I don't know, humans or animals, population means everybody, right? That's what we, we were used to when we hear the word population. Population of the city, that means everybody who lives in the city, right? Uh, now, in statistics, population is more uh, broad, more general, it doesn't... Uh, only concern humans or animals population means every single data set population data means every single data point that you may possibly uh, obtain uh, about certain subject matter for example um, population of all salaries okay so in the company that's uh, all the numerical values salaries for every single person in the in the company population of MPGs uh, in the in the carpool right so for the United States I don't know how many cars in the United States probably uh, billions I'm guessing several billion cars uh, in the US so that's every single car in the United States if we measure MPG miles per gallon fuel economy for each and every car we're going to get the population data okay so that's what statistics really is all about it's about trying to study populations but unfortunately populations are huge like for example cars right several billion cars how can we possibly humanly measure every single possible car's mpg that cannot be done it's not realistic so therefore uh, as much as we want to obtain all the data about certain subject matter that we can in most cases we it's not practical okay uh, or, or plain impossible simple as that or too expensive and too time consuming so theoretically possible but takes too much time and costs too much money so therefore uh, in all practical cases we have to settle for the sample okay so instead of measuring mpg of every single car and then calculating average mpg for example we can say well can do it for two billion cars really okay so instead of that i'm going to take a sample so instead of two billion cars i'm going to pick let's say 2000 cars and for each car i'm going to drive each car for for a couple of days right and uh, measure uh, how much fuel did the car consume and measure how far what what distance did the car travel and then divide one by another and i'm going to get the fuel economy average fuel economy for the car okay so samples is what we can get we want to get population but oftentimes it's not realistic not possible not practical too expensive too time consuming so therefore we have to settle for a small subset of the population and that is called sample so the techniques that we're going to discuss in this chapter we're really going to discuss only two different charts for uh, numerical data we're going to look at histogram and for non-numerical data categorical we're going to look at bar chart that's it uh, and then later we're going to look at more graphs actually um, during this semester but the techniques that we are going to look at this couple of charts they equally applicable to population or sample doesn't matter 
So the the histogram doesn't really care how much data you have. Um, you can you can have a small sample or the entire population. The principles are the same, so you can you can plot this this chart in exactly the same way. All right, so let's talk about lingo a little bit. Uh, variable. We actually discussed variables, right? When we talked about uh, programming, introduction to R. Variable in R uh, or any other programming language from that standpoint, R is no different from C++ or Visual Basic for applications or Python or JavaScript or anything else. Uh, a variable is just a name that points to a location in memory that holds certain values, right? So if I say x equals 5, that means that I recorded number 5. It's stored somewhere in the computer memory and x is just a pointer. x keeps track of whereabouts uh, where this number five is recorded inside the computer memory simple as that okay in statistics that's what we mean by variable here on this slide the uh, definition of the variable is different uh, a variable is something that varies right so it varies uh, some characteristic of either uh, population or a sample and from one observation to another observation it is different so every person has a different salary right so if I take all people at CNU and record their salaries, uh, the collection of all possible uh, salaries is the variable because from one person to another person's salary is different. Same thing about cars, right? I can calculate, take 2,000 cars, calculate average MPG for each and every car and uh, record these 2,000 numbers. Each car's MPG will be slightly different. So MPG is a variable because it varies from one uh, unit from one observation to another. So we're going to use letters X, Y, Z, something like this, in order to uh, denote the variable, to give variable a um, one-letter abbreviation. Uh, when we talk about the values of the variable, that means all possible values. So, for example, let's say you're taking a test, and on the test you can score as low as zero, if you didn't uh, answer any question correctly, or you can score as low as high as 100 if you answered every single question correctly. And everything else in between is possible, right? So let's for simplicity assume that you can get only integer, right? So there are no fractions, like you can get 85.7 uh, on the test. It's either 85 or 86 or 87, etc. Uh, so all uh, values from 0 to 100 are possible values for the random variable which is great. Now data, on the other hand, is what you observe. So if, for example, we have a class, in this case class of six students, or it can be class of 25 students or 30 students, um, obviously in the class of 25 students I will not get all the possible values of variable um, grade, right? I'm going to get certain specific values for 25 people who took the last test. So data are the observed values. So out of possible values, there's going to be 25 different numbers in the class of 25 people. And these are going to be my data points. Okay. All right, so data actually is plural. So when you say data, you have to say R. So data R, uh, a single for data is datum. Datum is one data point. So here, 83 is a datum, 71 is a datum. Uh, all these numbers, the collection of all these numbers, are data. Okay, that slide is very important because, uh, as you will see later, when we're going to look at specific tests, uh, depending on which type of data you're dealing with, you have to pick a different test. So, uh, statistics deals with um, really three different types of data. And data falls into two broad categories. One of them is numerical data. So, for example, um, well, MPGs of the cars, right? Every car has MPG. For example, the car that I'm driving, I believe it's averages to somewhere about 24 miles per gallon. So it's a number. No matter how you spin it, 24 miles per, per gallon, that's, that's how I characterize this specific car. I cannot randomly change that number, right? It's measurable. So numerical uh, variables are, uh, some things that you can measure and characterize with a number. 
uh, examples include people's heights, right? So if we use, for example, um, feet and inches uh, in order to measure people's heights, um, then you take a group of students, 25 students, you have 25 numbers. So uh, heights, weight, volume, temperature, uh, amounts of money measured in dollars and cents, miles per gallon, that's another another example. So something that can be measured using, um, I don't know, timer, chronometer, ruler, um, scale, etc., etc. So numerical data set, also called quantitative from the word quantity. Uh, another broad category and probably uh, I don't know if it's true or not really, but most data fall into this uh, into this group: categorical or qualitative data. So they're not numbers simply speaking, okay? Uh, and uh, categorical data really is, uh, uh, can be of two types. It's either nominal or ordinal. So we're going to discuss a little bit more about uh, ordinal and nominal uh, in just a few minutes. So interval data, is, as we just discussed, so to summarize, right? Quantity, something that's measured with, with a number, uh, and this number is determined objectively by simply measuring. So if I have, for example, um, scale, I can uh, put something on the scale and the scale will show me what's the weight in terms of pounds. And no matter how I spin it, that's the weight in terms of pounds. Nothing can be done about that. Um, this data is highly privileged in terms of um, I can perform a lot of operations, arithmetical operations, on the numerical data set. For example, I can calculate average. So if I have a group of 25 people and I measure everybody's height, I can calculate average height, calculate average height, can calculate uh, the range. So difference between highest, highest and lowest. I can calculate uh, variance, standard deviation, coefficient of variance. I can calculate all kinds of percentiles. I can calculate uh, MAD, mean absolute deviation, from the average height. So uh, a lot of computations are allowed on the numerical data. So from that standpoint, it's highly privileged. Okay, so let's discuss now categorical. Um, as we saw in this slide, categorical data falls under two broad categories, right? Nominal and ordinal. So let's first start with nominal. Nominal. Uh, it's uh, a variable that we can assign a numerical value to, but that numerical value is random. For example, uh, marital status. People can be either single or married or divorced or widowed. That's it pretty much. There is nothing else, right? So if I collect the data on the outside, let's say I want to I wanna look at uh, the distribution of, uh, you know, how um, uh, what, what, what are the percentages, what, what is the distribution of people who are single, who are married, uh, divorced or widowed out there. So I can go on the street and just start asking people, random people that walk by, what's your marital status? Can you please make a selection? Single, married, divorced or widowed. So they're going to tell me uh, one of these four things. And I can record these words exactly, right? I can record for one, I can record single, for another I can record married, etc., etc. Instead of that, I can give these uh, different categories a label. Single, I'm going to purely randomly assign number one. Married, again, randomly number two. Divorce three and widowed four. Okay. So after that, for each person, when I'm uh, going to record down what is their marital status, it's going to be a bunch of ones, twos, threes, and fours. Um, so these are numbers, right? Well, yeah, but they're just labels. Instead of 1, 2, 3, 4, I could assign them 10, 20, 30, 40. Or minus 10, minus 20, minus 30, plus 40. The choice is absolutely up to me. So these numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, they're random and they're not meaningful. They're pretty much just for convenience purpose. That's it. So from that standpoint, if I do the calculation on, on, my, on my results, they will not tell me the whole lot. Uh, for example, let's say I'm going to get... Uh, I'm going to get one person who is single, so I'm going to record a one. I'm going to get another person who is divorced, so I will record it a three. What's the average? 
Well, 1 plus 3 divided by 2, that's 2. That's married, right? So I have one person single and other divorced, but on average, every one of them is married. That doesn't make much sense, right? So therefore, calculations with nominal data uh, don't make sense. They simply, uh, and they don't make sense because simply because of the fact that the values that we pick for the categories or for these classes, they're random. They are, they're our choice. They're changeable. Uh, I can scramble them around and I'm going to get just just as good labeling system as I had before. So therefore, as opposed to interval data that we discussed is highly privileged, uh, and you can do all kinds of calculations and make sense out of them, nominal data, there's not much you can do. The only two calculations that we can perform on the nominal data is we can count how many people fall under the single category married, divorced, widowed, and then calculate percentages. And guess what? We actually did that in the previous lecture. Remember the example with Titanic? When we downloaded the Titanic data set, and one of the variables in the data set was class, which the passengers traveled. And uh, the options were crew, first class, second, and third class. So we used the table function from R to calculate the count for the crew, uh, for the first class, second class, and third class, and then we use the function prop.table, proportion, uh, proportion.table, in order to calculate what percentage of people were crew, first, second, and third class. That's pre and uh, class that people uh, traveled on Titanic is a good example of nominal data. Okay, so crew, first, second, and third class, they're just categories. They're just some classes. Uh, that have uh, names, crew, first, second, third, or we can assign them numbers, one, two, three, four, and the only thing that we can do is count how many people in each class and count what percentage each class represents. That's it. Nothing else we can do with nominal data. Now, very close to the nominal data uh, is ordinal data. This is also categorical data, and we have a bunch of categories or classes. Now, the difference between ordinal data and nominal is that in nominal case, let's go back, there is no natural order between classes. What is better, to be single or married? Psh, God knows, right? There is no, no single opinion about that. Uh, some people uh, like to be married, well, most of them probably, but a lot of people are single and they don't sweat it. So therefore there is no natural ordering between um, uh, different classes in the nominal data. Now, in the ordinal data, there is natural order. Uh, one simple example, which is probably the most popular example for the ordinal data, is a ranking system. So, for example, each time when you go to, well, not each time, but sometimes, right? When you go to, I don't know, hotel or Chick-fil-A, uh, they tell you, if you take the online survey, then we can give you $2 off from your next purchase, something like that. And you go online. And online it says, how would you rank your visit to this Chick-fil-A location? Uh, poor, one, poor or fair or good or very good or excellent, right? So uh, this is kind of an attempt to, to assign a value. Like how much value do you place on your, uh, on your visit to Chick-fil-A and your experience overall? Was the food good? You know, was the environment clean? Was your table? clean, was the uh, waiting time reasonable, that kind of stuff, right? So uh, the possible responses, poor, fair, good, very good, and excellent, again, are not numbers. This is how you subjectively assess your your experience, right, at Chick-fil-A, that's it. But uh, for, so from that standpoint, it's similar to single married, divorced, widow, right? It's just a bunch of categories. but. Unlike the previous case, poor is worse than fair. Fair is worse than good. Very good is better than good. And excellent is better than very good. So therefore, we can say that uh, they are ordered, and they're ordered exactly in this, uh, in this way. From poor to excellent. So therefore, since there is natural ordering, uh, two different categories, uh, what we have to do is when we assign uh, labels, such as one, two, three, four, five, two different categories, we have to follow the same order. Is fair uh, better than poor? 
Yes. So therefore, the value that we assign to fair, or two in this case, has to be higher than the value that we assign to poor. So in the um, labels, one, two, three, four, five, we have to follow the same order as exists between the different categories. But aside from that, the choice of the labels is again random. So instead of one, two, three, four, five, I could assign six, 18, 23, 45, 88. Does it keep the same order? Yes, it does. Um, or alternatively, minus 10, 3, 25.8, 100, and 1,000 for excellent. It keeps the same order. Now, that actually creates um, kind of the same conundrum, right, for ordinal data. Because the labels that we assign to different categories are random, 1, 2, 3, 4, or 6, 18, 23, 45, 88, uh, again, calculations don't make sense, most of them anyway. So I can not calculate the mean, I can not calculate the standard deviation or variance or range. So none of these beautiful things that I can calculate about the interval data, numerical data, uh, apply here. Again, because of randomness of, of how I assign labels to different classes. But there is one calculation that makes sense for ordinal data that doesn't make sense for the nominal data. And that's actually, uh, as you guess, probably can guess, it deals with the fact that we can order the responses. In case of nominal data, let's go back. I can't order the responses, right? There is no natural order between them. I can scramble these labels, assign single equals four, married remains at two, divorced is one, and widowed is three. That's going to be just as good. Uh, in case of ordinal data, the labels, one, two, three, four, have to follow the same order as the categories themselves. So therefore, the only thing that makes sense for the ordinal data, aside, of course, from calculating the counts for each category and their percentages, just like for the nominal data, the only other thing that makes sense, uh, which doesn't apply to the nominal data, is something that's called median. Median is a response in the middle. So it separates 50% of the data. Yeah, and basically this is a slide that summarizes uh, what I'm just saying. Ordinal data, we can calculate frequencies and relative frequencies, like for nominal data, but also we can select the point in the middle, median, separating uh, upper 50% of the data from bottom 50% of the data. So um, let's actually take a look at, uh, all right, Apparently, I yeah, I eliminated the slide. Okay. So uh, hierarchy of the data, as we discussed, uh, interval data highly privileged, most privileged. So uh, the values, the possible values, are real numbers. Can be positive, oftentimes can be negative. Uh, for example, let's say heights of people cannot be negative, but temperatures can be negative, right? So uh, all calculations are valid, as long as they make sense, uh, and as long as you can interpret them. Uh, and um, if, you, if you take a step down, then you're down to the ordinal uh, data. Uh, ordinal data is underprivileged in, in, in terms of most of the calculations that make sense for the interval data, we should probably change that uh, from interval to uh, numerical. So here I use the word interval, but really what I mean is numerical, numerical data. Uh, ordinal data is uh, losing a lot of actually calculations um, that are still possible on the numerical data. For example, things like uh, mean, standard deviation, range, variance, coefficient of variation, uh, they, we, we can't compute them, simply because the values that you assign uh, to different categories are random, we discussed that. Uh, so the only things that you can calculate with ordinal data, again, counts, how many observations is in each class, percentages, what percentage of observations in each class, and also median. Actually, we're going to discuss how to calculate median in the next set of uh, slides which is numerical uh, descriptive techniques. So today we're discussing graphical descriptive techniques. Uh, in the next deck of slides, we're going to discuss numerical descriptive techniques, and that's 
when we're going to talk about median. Uh, so median makes sense for ordinal data. And when we move down to the nominal data, least privileged. So that means that uh, because class is not really ordered in any way, there is no natural order between them, natural relationship between them, uh, calculations that are dealing with uh, ordering observations from lowest to highest, they don't exist anymore. So median is not possible. And the only thing that you can do with nominal data is how many observations in each class and what are the percentages in each class. And that's it. All right, so therefore, here, this arrow shows you that we, we go from highly privileged data set, numerical, uh, to most unprivileged, least privileged data set, nominal. All right, so uh, let's go through this exercise quickly just to see. Uh, residents of condominium were recently surveyed and asked a series of questions. Identify what type of data is relevant for each question. So, number one, what is your age? So again, our options are numerical, nominal, ordinal. Age is a number measured in years, right? No matter how you spin it, it's going to be the same, uh, the same number. There is no alternative way to measure age in years. So therefore, this is a numerical data, okay? On what floor do you live? Well, uh, could, could be living on the first floor, second floor, third floor, etc. So you would think that this is a numerical data, right? Well, let's see. Uh, what if I have two people? One person lives on the first floor, another person lives on the second floor. Can I calculate the average? 1 plus 2 divided by 3 equals 1.5. So a person on average lives on the floor one and a half. It's like Harry Potter kind of stuff, right? Platform was, uh, was uh, nine and three quarters. Doesn't make much sense, right? So therefore, um, argument can be made that what floor do you live on? Uh, that data is ordinal, right? Because there is ordering after all, okay? Second floor is above the first. Third floor is above the second. So there is ordering, but calculations probably don't make much sense. So this is ordinal data. Do you own or rent? That boils down to the question, is there natural order between renting and or owning? The answer is probably no. A lot of people want to own real estate, own an apartment, right? Uh, but at the same time, you can find people who say, why, why, why would I own? If something breaks down, somebody pays for my repairs. I like that. Okay, so I like to, uh, to rent. So therefore, this is nominal data. Right, bunch of people, half of them own, half of them rent, and there is no natural ordering between, between the two. How many square feet in your residence? Well, obviously, numerical data. Right, you can measure the area of an apartment down to uh, the last digit uh, using a number of square feet. So this is a bunch of numbers. Do you have pool on site or or not? Um, again, no clear cut answer. Right. Some people may like having pool, probably most people will like having pool on site, but some people will say, well, it, it's getting too noisy, so I wish we didn't have that pool. So therefore, that again is nominal data. There is no natural ordering between yes, no. How many roommates do you live with? That is probably numerical, right? So um, calculations make sense. You can calculate the average, uh, the range, right? Highest number of roommates lowest number of roommates. So a lot of calculations make sense. So that's numerical data set. What is the color of your kit counter uh, um, top in the kitchen? Blue, black, um, gray. These are categories and there is no order between them. So therefore, that data is nominal. How many months did you live in your current place? That's time measured in terms of months. There is no other way to measure that. And uh, therefore, it's numerical data. All calculations make sense. Range, mean, uh, median, etc., etc. On a scale from 1 to 5, 5 being the best and 1 being the worst, rate your living experience. Well, these are categories, right? 1 is poor, 5 is excellent. And because there is ordering between them, this is ordinal data. 
What do you think about parking space? Is it adequate in your uh, condominium? Well, the answers are yes, no. Boils down to is there natural order between them? How many people do you think like uh, to have bad parking situation? Probably not a lot, if any, right? So an argument can be made that this is ordinal data because no, uh, do you have adequ adequate uh, parking space? If you say no, that's bad. But if you say yes, that's good. So since there is ordering between these two uh, answers, yes, no, um, I would argue this is ordinal data. Okay. Uh, now in the next 15 minutes, we have about 15 minutes, right? In this lecture, I'm trying to keep the duration uh, uh, at around 50 minutes per, per lecture. Let's take a look at uh, a way to summarize the data as a, a graph, okay? So as we discussed, nominal and ordinal data, uh, there is not a lot can be done aside from the fact that we can summarize the, the data uh, in terms of uh, number of counts in each category uh, and also uh, calculate proportions right of uh, observations in each category and some of the proportions equals to 100 so uh, the most popular way to, to represent the nominal or ordinal data as a graph is something that's called bar chart so we're going to actually take a look at the bar chart using the employment data so here is basically, yeah, so I'm going to switch over to uh, the data itself. Let me go back to, yeah, this one right here. Okay, so on our uh, Scholar website, I have posted the file employment.csv. So download that file and I'm using PC. So I have to move as we discussed the file. Have to take the file from downloads. Um, I'm gonna cut the file from here and bring it over to uh, f uh, to the disk C drive C data. So paste. Okay. So here's my employment data. All right. And this is a comma separate value file CSV file. As we discussed before, that's all the data sets that we're going to um, manipulate this semester are going to be CSV files. That's it. All right, so I'm going to bring up my R Studio. That's our tool, right? So first things first, you know, uh, for, for the time being, I'm going to leave some comments. Uh, later, as we, well, I'm probably going to keep leaving comments as we go through the semester. This way, when you download my uh, scripts, you will be able to see exactly what each line does. Okay, what's the meaning of this line? So first things first, of course, very first thing that we ever do when we're analyzing the data is we have to read the data into the memory okay read data from csv file all right so data is about employment so i'm going to call it employment underscore data okay and again you probably should be doing that along with me as we already discussed earlier today i believe uh because it's a good uh, practice and then after that also I'm going to post homeworks and before the exams I'm going to post practice problems so the more uh, code you write the better it is uh, just in general uh, the, the more sense it starts to make okay so reading is done by using the function read CSV and I used to write file equal right let me make a short uh, do the shortcut okay I can just go ahead and skip the whole file equal and just give the uh, read CSV function uh, the address, the, the path to the file. So file equal is optional. You can leave it out and it will understand that yeah, what you're trying to do is communicate where is this file located. And again, you have to be precise, right? So I have to say the file is sitting on the drive C in the folder data and the file is called employment.csv. In the previous lecture, I showed you that if I leave out .csv, it will not end well, right? So, for example, like this, it will say, "I don't, I don't know what you mean. There is no such file, so you have to be precise." Uh, employment .csv. Boom. Okay. So now well, let's take a look. Uh, in the previous lecture, I told you that it's uh, pretty much always a good idea 
to look at the structure of the file, right? Explore. Explore the structure. I spelled it. Structure of the file. Uh, of data. Right? So str. Short for structure. Employment. Data. Okay, so it sees that I have something that's called employment data. All right. Uh, and let me give it a couple of enters so that you can see at the bottom of the screen my data frame right we discussed that each time when we read data from the csv file it becomes a data frame it's a two-dimensional object that has columns and in columns i have variables and it has rows and in rows i have individual data points okay so uh, in my case i have 252 observations well, um, so the story behind this uh, is this. Let me bring back the PowerPoint slides. Okay, the story behind that is this. Student um, placement office in the university wants to find out uh, what are the most popular, second most popular, etc., areas of employment for the graduates. So they picked up a sample of graduates, 252, you just seen it, right? and ask them, uh, these are business students we're assuming, right? What is your area of employment? So possible answers were accounting, finance, management, marketing, just like in Luther School of Business. But sometimes people don't find employment in any of these areas. For example, let's say I'm good with coding, so therefore I'm going to work a software quality assurance uh, engineer or something like that. So it's not accounting, finance, management, or marketing. So in this case, I'm gonna say, well, it's neither, therefore other. So this is kind of a uh, dumb category, right? So answers that do not fit in uh, any of these four, they're all dumped right here in number five, okay? So why can that be useful? Well, uh, we can kind of take a look at where the students are finding uh, their jobs. And if, for example, management or finance happens to be the most popular area of employment, then we're going to bring more finance companies. For, for the finance positions uh, to, to campus. All right, so, and the uh, answers were recorded, not as accounting, finance, management, marketing, but one, two, three, four, five. So it's a bunch of numbers. All right, so let's bring back the mm, R studio. Yeah, and that's what I see exactly, right? So for now, actually, jump, oh, not jump, sorry, we're using R, right? Uh, R thinks that uh, what I have in my data set is uh, integers, right? Numerical uh, data. Well, because these are technically numbers, right? Uh, R doesn't know that one stands for accounting, two stands for finance, etc., etc. So for for this tool, these are just a bunch of numbers. Okay. So my data frame contains one variable, and it's called employment area. That's the name of my column inside inside the data set, right? And there are 252 graduates that we surveyed. Okay, so uh, let's do this. So first things first, what I'm going to do is create the same exact thing as we did for Titanic example. Remember, people traveling in crew, first class, second class, and third class. We calculated counts, right? I'm going to do exactly that. So I'm going to treat numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 in my data set as just categories. Labels are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, but I'm going to treat them as categorical, okay? So... Uh, Pound sign, I promised you to leave comments, right? Create a tabular summary of data. All right. Okay, so, well, let me call employment, uh, employment underscore summary, right? Okay. So I'm going to use the same function, table. And uh, remember how we discussed in the previous lecture, how do I uh, relate, how do I call for a specific column or variable from my data set? My variables are located in columns. So when I say column in the data set, it's the same thing as I have variable. So in this case, variable is called employment area, right? Uh, so in order to for me to point to a specific column in my data set, my data frame, I 
have to provide the name of the data after that dollar sign and the name of the column well, in this case there is only one column so not much choice right so i'm going to say here employment data all right that's the name of my data set and then dollar sign and that's the only column that i have employment underscore area all right so let's go ahead and run this uh, line again you can run either by clicking run or just clicking somewhere in the in the line and uh, control enter well now let's take a look at my uh, mm, uh, at, at the summary employment summary Kaboom. all right so here's the summary people who said one there are 72 of them and one if you remember from the slide stands for accounting people who are number two finance there are 52 of them number three that is oh jesus what are they is it marketing or management don't remember management okay so people who are employed in the management area there are 36 of them marketing is 64 and others that are neither of these four there are 28 of them so this is my table or summary and uh, i can probably interpret that easily simply because there are only five categories but what if i have more than five categories what if i have 20 categories so from uh, by looking at these numbers i can see that the most popular is number one that's accounting second most popular is four that's marketing um then i have number two which is finance that's the third popular then i have management in the fourth place and other is in the fifth place right it's easy because there are only five of them what if i have 25 categories or 50 categories then it becomes a little bit more challenging right so therefore let's discuss um a picture how can we put a picture on this data and make it a little bit easier to interpret but before we do that let me remind you how you can calculate the percentages so same data but in you know, instead of counts 72 52 36 etc i'm going to have uh, percentages what percentage of people go in accounting right in finance in management marketing etc so here i'm going to calculate percentages of uh, observations in each category in each oh, let's call it class okay so again it's done by uh, calling the function prop dot table prop stands for proportion and what i have to send to the function prop table is my vector of employment summaries so these five numbers and when i run this line control enter you can see that accounting is responsible for roughly 28.6 percent of all people in the graduating class uh, is area of employment uh, mm, finance is 20.6 then management is 14.3 roughly speaking marketing is 25.4 and other roughly speaking 11 percent okay but uh again what i want to do is not just give my users or whoever is going to be using uh, this data uh just a bunch of numbers i want to present it with a picture because pictures we're, we're visual animals humans are visual animals picture is worth one thousand of words right so instead of me giving a bunch of numbers uh i can give a picture and from the picture is going to be pretty clear what is that that's going on okay so here i'm going to write a new line create a bar plot of areas oops areas of employment okay so uh bar plot is done by uh the function which is called bar plot bar and as i start typing you can see that uh, there is a dynamic help or as i call it intellisense right intelligent um kind of cheat sheet right so uh, i can see that r knows what bar plot is so i'm gonna say bar plot and for the bar plot i'm going to uh just uh send the employment summary just like this okay so i'm gonna say hey here is the vector that contains counts 
for each one of the categories, one, two, three, four, five. Can you please plot that for me? And when I run this line, there you go. So I believe it's the first time when we use this area of our R Studio window, okay? Plots. So here's my graphical summary. And from this summary, I can see that tallest bar. So over here, vertically, I have counts of this, right? The first one was accounting, and that was 72. And you can see that it's slightly above 70. So that's your accounting. That is your finance. So you can see that the tallest bar is accounting. Second tallest bar is number four, which is marketing, if I remember. And here's your finance. Uh, here's your management. And number five is other. Okay? So it's that simple to create a bar plot in, um, uh, in R. All right, uh, one more thing, well, not one more thing, actually, a few more things. So this lecture is going to go actually a little bit above time limit that I set for myself. Let's make it a little bit more cultured, okay? So first thing that I can do with um, my, my plot in order to make it more uh, readable is I can show the main title right here on the top, okay? I can show the label for the X, horizontal axis, for the vertical axis, and well, let's, let's go with this program for now. So uh, that means that for the function bar plot, I have to send send it more parameters. So, for example, the main title is given by the parameter called main, and you can see I start typing after the comma, and uh, R Studio says, "Oh yeah, I know what you mean. There is such thing as main, and main." Uh, you can even see it says overall and subtitle for the plot. So I'm going to say main. And because title is really a description, so it's a text, I have to include that in the quotations mark. So how should I title this thing? So uh, distribution of areas of employment. How about that? All right. Then I have to give it a label for the X direction and for the Y direction. And that is done by X lab. And as I start typing, it says X lab label for the X axis. Again, since this is a text, I have to include it in quotation marks. So one, two, three, four, five, right? That's my X. So areas of employment. All right. And similarly, just like I did X lab, X label, I have Y lab. Y label. Y label right now I have counts, right? All these things are really counts. So therefore I'm gonna say counts. Okay. So let's run this line. And you can see that I have my main title, distribution of areas of employment, areas of employment, counts, all nine yards. Alright. Uh, also I wanted to show you, I believe, a couple of other things. Uh, like one of them, for example, is I can change the color. Okay, so by default, you can see it gives every uh, bar a gray color. Okay, but I can change the color if I want to. So that is done by, you know what, let me go ahead and start a new line. Right, so um, the, the, it's, it's the same command, it's just split between two lines. This way, you can see it in all entirety on the screen. Okay, color equal. Uh, so I don't have to type the word color because the parameter is called COL, uh, uh, call. So uh, R is intelligent enough to recognize the basic colors as we type them. For example, if I want it to be blue, there you go. If I want it to be yellow, all I have to do is change to yellow. Whoa, that's aggressive color. Okay, so how about light blue? Let's see if it recognizes light blue. Uh, yeah, it does. Ah, look at that. Light blue, that's kind of nice. All right, uh, another thing, a couple of more things that I wanted to show you about, uh, about the function uh, bar plot. Number one. Um, wouldn't it be nice if on the top of each of these columns I would have actually counts? So instead of me guessing, is it 72, is it 71, how about this one, is it 51 or 53 or 52? Can I just show the labels on the top? Like what are the counts, right? 
and it turns out that yes I can so if I uh, no not in this one okay so I'm gonna take it back uh, I know that in histogram that's possible but apparently not not in the bar chart not in the bar plot all right um, so then one one more thing that I wanted to show you is uh, how can we modify this one two three four five what is one two three four five I have to remember that one is accounting uh, two is finance three is management four is marketing uh, can I just replace one two three four five with actual names apparently I can actually so and this is how it's done I have to specify yet another uh, argument and that would be names dot arc names argument apparently functions uh, to get uh, or set the names of an object okay that's a little bit vague but here's how we use it okay so instead of one two three four five I'm going to create a range of names one stands for accounting two for finance etc and uh, uh, this time actually I put all of that in your uh, slides so let me show you so everything that we do I put in slides including yeah including this one how we use names arc okay so uh, what we have to do is pass the function a vector uh, of all the possible names so a collection of all possible names so I'm going to use uh, just like we did for the vector variables right use the function C which stands for combine right C I'm going to combine names the first one is accounting next one is finance next one is oh god uh, management yeah probably management management all right number four is marketing and the last one number five is other and now when I run this line my one two three four five are being replaced with counting finance management marketing isn't that nice okay uh, one last thing that I wanted to point out is this uh, isn't it nice to know what are the names of the variables and what they expect like for example names dot arc expects a vector of the names right the first one is just basically a set of numbers or vector also this one is text maybe there are some other things that I don't know uh, so oftentimes what what's helpful is uh, to look up how exactly the function is being used so are there any more tricks that can be done with bar plot function probably there are universal way how you can look that up in R um, and our studio is this so looking up help for the function for the function okay so I can type help literally the word help that's by itself as a function I want help with bar plot okay this one and when I run this line right here it's on a different tab so my plot is still here but on the tel uh, tab help here is the description of what function bar plot can do and apparently here is uh, here's what it takes okay here is the list of all the arguments number one height we use that one right so heights 72 uh, 32 etc etc so the vector that we sent the very first thing that we sent to the function bar plot was a list of heights right then uh, there is a variable called width I didn't know that uh, you could you, apparently you can set up the width of the of the column that's what I'm guessing that's what it stands for okay we used names arg but there is such thing as uh, legend dot text uh, horizontal Oh, that's 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 actually interesting so let's let's go ahead and try this okay so right now uh, the bars are uh, vertical right can I can I make them horizontal oh, let's try apparently from what I just read in the help function all I can uh, all I have to do is say uh, horiz h or h o r i z and it's either true or false right so uh-huh as I start typing Horiz says yeah I know what you mean okay 
So if I want that horizontal, I'm just going to say true. Let's see what happens. Look at that. So uh, I had vertical columns and now they're horizontal. Now it screwed up a little bit my uh, how, how it looks, right? Because I don't have apparently here space for finance. Here I don't have enough space for marketing. So therefore, how about I say horizontal false? If it's not horizontal, then it's vertical, right? And I'm back to my original uh, original uh, bar chart. So this is very helpful. Help is very helpful, kind of funny, right? Funny sounding. Uh, this is a very helpful uh, option, feature to engage. If you are not sure how to use certain function in R or Studio, all you have to do is say, give me help on that one, and then here's the description. It gives you the full list of what can you do. Wow, that's a big list actually, right? Uh, so we didn't, uh, we, we used only a fraction of these possible options that you can set with uh, with bar plot. So therefore, uh, bar plot is very flexible, right? Apparently you can set teeny tiny, minute variations uh, and details uh, of, of your bar plot. And that applies not only to bar plot, that applies to actually a lot of other um, things in R, such as, for example, histogram that we're going to discuss next, etc., etc. So looking up help on certain function, it's something useful uh, to have in mind. And another way, by the way, to, to call the help is this. Instead of me saying help with bar plot, I'm going to put question mark and say bar plot. And when I run this line, it gives me the same exact thing. So a couple of ways how I can call up help on a certain function in R. I can either type help and then the name of the function that I want, okay? Or I can uh, type question mark and the name of the function that I want, and it will give me the same thing. All right, we went a little bit over our traditional limit of 50 minutes, so I'm going to finish it right here, and the next stop is histogram.